Throughout history, there have been some standout years that have defined the culture of video games. But picking a year that's most important to games often seems like an impossible ask. Popular answers include 1996, with the release of the Nintendo 64, and Quake, and Diablo, and Duke Nukem 3D. And then there's the slightly more correct people who say 1998, with Half-Life and StarCraft, Ocarina of Time, Metal Gear Solid, and Pokemon Red and Blue. But in attempting to isolate and identify the most important year of games, you have to look past the simple titles and look into the way that the industry has shifted the most. After careful examination, we here at Dorkly have determined that, without a doubt, the most important year in gaming, and for reasons that are as surprising as they are true, is 2009. So here are five reasons that 2009 was the most important year for video games. And notice that I didn't say best, because that's obviously 1998. Can't argue with it. Number one, Japanese developers break the mold and begin a hardcore renaissance. Here's the tale of two developers, one in Osaka and one in Tokyo, who both broke away from what they saw as a constrictive and repetitive culture of publishing in order to make something truly unique for the kind of gamers who they believed had massively been underserved. The players just like them. Under the newly formed company Platinum Games, Hideke Kamiya brought the world its spiritual successor to the Devil May Cry series, Bayonetta, which challenged players to execute perfect combos and maintain multipliers with a level of fast twitch precision that could only be achieved through the most tightly honed reflexes. Meanwhile, Hidetaka Miyazaki at From Software saw an opportunity to take over a near-abandoned RPG project to craft a kind of game that he felt like no longer existed. One that valued caution and deliberate traversal of hostile environment, a project that eventually became Demon Souls. While both games were considered unsuccessful from a sales perspective, the dedicated few who were starving for games like these became the vanguard of a fiercely loyal following. As the years went on and these games built up a cultural cachet that made each follow-up title more beloved than the one before it, eventually building to the modern blockbuster hits like Nier Automata and Dark Souls 3. Two extremely different takes on a gothic pan-European horror action game that nonetheless were like a breath of fresh air after Western AAA games grew over-reliant on tutorials and quick time events. 2009 is when a new generation of Japanese developers first asked their audience to get good and had spectacular results. Also, Bayonet is just cool, so that's just the, that's just that. Number two, thank God, the death of plastic peripherals. 2009 was also the year that put the final nail in the coffin of the long-standing tradition of bulky gaming peripherals, dating back as far as the original Magnavox Odyssey in 1972. Racing wheels and light guns and all sorts of unique limited-use controllers were as integral to video games as cartridge slots and composite cables. And while the trend had its ups and downs, the advent of the Nintendo Wii and the rise of Guitar Hero and Rock Band loaded the American living room with tons of plastic crap. I still have flashbacks. It's horrible. Like you open a drawer and there's just stuff. Yet it wasn't until the catastrophic thud of products like the Tony Hawk ride board and the DJ Hero turntable that consumers finally had enough. Both of these flops quickly made their way to bargain bins and doomed other future follies like the Kinect and the U-Draw tablet before they even hit store shelves. A decade later, and most gamers still don't have the time or energy to set up and store these bulky monstrosities, and most of the popular party games now just require you to whip out your phone and you, you've already got it in your pocket. Just like put on, put on Jackbox for Christ's sake, just put that on. Just do that. I don't want to touch a plastic thing ever again. No disrespect to that turntable though. It, it, it worked. It was kind of cool. Number three, AAA doubles down on annual franchises. Bolstered by the technological leap from the SD era, major publishers cemented the status of their top tier franchises with two sequels that started a reign which only recently is starting to show signs of weakness. Infinity Ward's Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 burned the words no Russian into our collective psyche and ran away with over 20 million copies sold. In Montreal, Ubisoft improved on the framework of their original historical throat slitter by leaps and bounds, and that's the best as pun in this video, I'm sorry, with Assassin's Creed 2, introducing the world to the flamboyant and infectiously confident Ezio Atatore de Firenze. 
While both games are classics in their own right, they also delivered so much raw spectacle that gamers were quickly trained to expect massive leaps in refinement and fidelity at an unsustainable rate. It's here that I believe the bloated, over-budgeted, over-hyped AAA sequel machine kicked into high gear, pushing studios to deliver groundbreaking graphics and novel mechanics, but not too novel, can't change things uh, too much, at a rate that can only be achieved with near infinite money and a strong anti-union culture. Whoops, sucks for the devs. This was the dominant wisdom in game publishing until the next entries on this list planted a seed that would someday break the very earth beneath these titan's feet. Unionize, people, Jesus Christ. Leave after eight or 10 hours. <laughs> Go see your families, please, Rockstar. Number four, free to play and early access begin their inevitable world domination. You know what's better than paying hundreds of people to make a multi-million dollar franchise? Having a small handful of people create billion dollar juggernauts that sideswipe an entire industry and run away like a fucking semi-truck. 2009 is when two seemingly niche, humble pieces of software began their climb to worldwide dominance and forever changed the way games were developed and paid for. Besides popularizing the now ubiquitous crafting and survival mechanics, you know, step one, start punching every tree that you see, Notch created a game that was different from other popular titles by offering automatic updates that continuously added new content, keeping an engaged community enthralled and contributing to the game's development. Also important is that Minecraft is able to do something that was previously thought impossible, get users to pay for a product that was nakedly incomplete. Meanwhile, the team at Riot Games had finished three years worth of work to release something that would change the world, a free standalone version of a free mod of Warcraft 3. League of Legends dropped with a mere 17 champions compared to the near Pokemon-like number of 143 as of writing this video, and a unique business model where the game was free to start playing, but all future cosmetics and champions were to be purchased with in-game currency, some of which was earned through playtime, while premium currency cost real money. This simple business model hadn't even spread to mobile games by this point. The App Store at the time was dominated by mobile ports of AAA games, which shockingly cost full price for a contained experience. Another thing that both of these games did beautifully is that they were both deceptively simple to start and had endlessly deep strategy and mechanics to learn. Plus, they could run on even low-spec hardware. While millions of people owned PS3s and Xbox 360s, there were billions of people with access to crappy PCs. Even if it was just a school or an internet cafe beige box, that untapped audience is what let Minecraft become an underground hit with a grade school set and made League of Legends such an international sensation. So if you're surprised to see the meteoric rise of Fortnite, just remember we're the building slash crafting slash free to play slash multiplayer slash competitive fad started. 2009, it's, the, it's in the title of the video. That's where it came from. Number five, genuine classics that will stand the test of time. I know, I know, I know that I kind of hand waved games at the, at the front of this video, but this, this final one is more of a catch all category, but it's the only place that I can acknowledge all the titles that, while maybe not paradigm shifting, were still so good that you have to sit back and think, dang, these all came out in the same year. It makes sense. The history of video games is littered with moments when publishers are free to expand upon ideas that they had rushed out the door to launch new hardware, and devs have had enough time to make the most out of each console's unique strengths to push out previously impossible visuals. 2009 is the year that we got Batman Arkham Asylum, which raised the bar for melee combat and elevated superhero licenses beyond cheap cash-ins that they had become, and Uncharted 2 Among Thieves not only made PS3 owners feel like their $600 investment was worth it, it established Naughty Dog's reputation as one of the most polished studios working today. The hits kept coming with games like Resident Evil 5, still the best-selling entry in the franchise, even though it's horrible, and Left 4 Dead 2, bringing addictive of online co-op to the genre of zombie slaughtering, while Infamous and Prototype battled it out over the title of best open world superpower action game, you know, at least until Saints Row 4 comes out. Or you could bust out your Nintendo DS to play revolutionary cards like Scribble Knots or The Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks or Rhythm Heaven. You know, I know that this is gonna sound cynical, but I think we're gonna see a lot more nostalgia for 2009 very soon. The kids who were 12 years old back then are now graduating college and entering the adult world, and it's around this time that the nostalgia instinct will start to spread around the rest of pop culture. The 10 years that have passed since 2009 have flown by. They may not have felt like a whole lot of time, but that's still a full decade. But I think that we're also gonna be feeling the reverberations of 2009 for years to come. Also, 1998 ruled, please let me be a child again, oh God. 
It's never going to happen. I'm old as shit.